We don't need Thanksgiving to practice Thanksgiving. True? Amen? Like, we have a lot to be thankful for, and we should recognize, above all else, um, what we're thankful for. And for those of you that have been in this, this class, and we've studied Romans 3, 21 to 26, justification, that beautiful, beautiful doctrine of justification. Um, Paul sets up very, very well, I think, why we should be thankful, Romans 1 through 3. Right? Romans 1 through 3, uh, up until verse 21, are, we're in trouble. Right? We have been found guilty in the courtroom of heaven. And we are guilty, 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 apart from the grace of our Father. Okay, and so that's Romans 3, 21 to 26. Again, this is what Paul's argument is in this book, in this letter that he wrote to the church in Rome. It is, as we've mentioned before, his magnum opus uh, on the gospel. This is Paul's presentation of the gospel and how it should affect our lives. And we are now in the height of this section where he talks about this is how it should impact you. Okay, and so we'll go through chapter 6 through 8. We're in the middle of 6, where we'll be for the next 7 years. And then we'll, uh, <laughs> and then we'll transition at some point um, to 7 and 8. But um, when we get to 9 through 11 again, reminder, 9 through 11 is, well, what about the Jews? What about God's promises to the Jewish people? And that'll be fun because that'll have some eschatological, some end times um, emphasis there. That'll be fun for us to talk about because we won't all agree and we're all guessing anyway. <laughs> Maybe we're not. Maybe we have different feelings on that. But uh, we'll talk about the eschatology of that and what that means for the Jewish people. And then we come right back to Romans 12. And from Romans 12 on, that's the time to take a holiday. That's when you want to leave. You don't want to be here for that. Because that's when uh, Paul starts by saying, be a living sacrifice. And I love how Sam puts that, right? That uh, uh, Sam Hoffman will often say, the problem with being a living sacrifice is it always tries to crawl off the altar. <laughs> right? And so um, we, we get Romans 12 is be a living sacrifice. We get Romans 13. We don't want to say that out loud because we live in Wyoming. So we don't want to say the word submit to anybody because we don't <laughs> submit to anybody. Right? This is Wyoming, for gosh sake. Right? And so, obviously, there's a little sarcasm there, but we'll talk about what that means in Romans 13. So it's, it is really kind of an intense series of chapters as we get into Romans 12. So if you're going to take a holiday, take that one because... It can be convicting, to be quite honest. But we are right now in what I would argue is, if we're paying attention, perhaps the most convicting part of, of Romans. Romans chapter 6. Okay? Um, here we'll talk about, uh, we'll continue to talk about the idea that, that um, you are no longer a slave to sin. Now what that means is frightening. Right? Because if you're no longer a slave to sin, that means you, you have control over it. And that's frightening. That's something that, that uh, maybe we need to spend some time thinking about. <laughs> that we have control when we sin now as believers. Now, we're still going to sin. We're still, as Paul says, in the flesh. Uh, but this passage is pretty heavy. So... And it's also one we want to make sure that we interpret accurately or we can get stuck in some ditches. So we will go through that now. Let's pray and then we'll get rolling. Okay? God, thanks for today. Thank you, um, Father, that we can come together. God, that we can worship you as a body. God, that we can worship you as believers through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that. God, as we celebrate this time of thankfulness with family which does not always promote thankfulness um, god as we um, enter into this season that is difficult um, for some god that our society likes to obscure 
the truth with. Father, I pray that we would constantly be thankful for what You have done for us. God, that we would not even have to worry about phrases like the real reason for this. God, that we would just understand that we are thankful because You have sent Your Son, Jesus Christ. God, that apart from Him, we are nothing. So God, thank You that that's how much You love us. Thank You, Father, that You have chosen to shine Your grace and Your mercy upon us. Father, as we enter this passage where we are talking about the old self and the new, God, I pray that that, um, it would be convicting to us. God, that we would be ever convicted. And yet, Father, we would be ever thankful as we recognize that even as we work to be holy as You are holy, Father, that we understand and remember that above all is grace. So Father, thank You for how much You loved us. God, be with us today. Be glorified and honored by the things that we say today. In Jesus' name, Amen. So beginning here, um, I'll I'll go back to the, the top of that handout. Um, where we have Romans chapter 6, 1 through 14. Again, the bolded area is where we're focused right now, but I'll read the whole passage. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let no sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. So, I mentioned this, I've been mentioning this over the last couple of weeks, um, that this passage has some things we have to be careful in interpretation of. For example, um, uh, you'll remember we talked about the baptism at the beginning. Right? There are some things you can get real sideways and get in a ditch on the wrong side of the road here on this baptism thing. For example, some believe that baptism is, is a, uh, salvation is a product of baptism. Biblically, that's not the case. And clearly, Paul, the guy who is like most perhaps anti-works in any of his letter in terms of salvation, right? Salvation is... By grace through faith. Paul is very clear about that. Is not going to say, oh, in baptism. Okay, so I think that's very clear in Pauline literature. But it's very easy to get sideways on that passage. Okay? So we have to be careful when we interpret this. And there are a few in today's and next week's that you'll see that in. Having said all of that, there's a very simple point here. So this is, this is kind of that beautiful simplicity 
um, that we see in Romans. And the beautiful simplicity is, stop sinning. I mean, that's really what it is, right? You are free from this. So stop. No, don't continue to sin that grace may abound. That's crazy. That's ludicrous. Stop that. Stop sinning. You're no longer, you're no longer enslaved to sin. It no longer has dominion over you. Right? That's the very simple message that Paul has here. Now it's a lot more in depth. And for those of you that are nerds like me, you could really dive into this and figure out like, well, for example, baptism. What's he talking about? And we spent some time on that. Um, we could talk about what does it mean to be dead to sin? Do you, you know, when Paul says in verse 7, for example, and let me just um, read that for you real quick. Um, uh, verse 7 says, uh, one who has died has been set free from sin. Like honestly, in that phrase, one who has been one who has died has been set free. Anyone know what the word is? Set free there. Well, this this is a doozy. The word set free in the Greek is the word justify. So, is Paul really suggesting that you're justified in death? That your justification only occurs in death? Well, clearly he's not, right? But so you and the translators try and try and demonstrate that by not translating it justified. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Remember, that's a forensic legal term, declared not guilty. The question is, what does Paul mean by that? And so you can spend a lot of time and you can go through a lot of different commentaries. You can read a lot of different interpretations of that passage. But I think it's important as we get into this section where there is so much, I think we, we need so much caution as we interpret it to not miss the very simple truth. Okay? The very simple truth. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Verse 14. Okay? That's the simple truth of this passage. Are we to continue in sin? No. No. Sin has no dominion over you. Now, even that is something that we'll have to spend some time working through. Because if sin has no dominion, why do we still sin? What do we do with sin in the innermost place? The, the sins that we commit that we don't even recognize that we commit. What do we do with that? And so there's a lot that we have to go through here. But the simple point here, and I think it's really important, and, and I know this group doesn't have to worry about it, but I do. Right? Like, we need to focus on being holy as God is holy. Now, that does not mean that we need to be legalists who are out trying to point out how each other are falling short of holiness. Right? Do you get that? Like, it's not my job to look for all the areas in which sin is occurring in your life. Now, obviously, there's, you know, there's a discipline component and there's, you know, confronting sin when we see it. But there are groups of folks out there that that's what they want to do. It seems like that's their target. They want to go confront sin at every turn. And that should not be the case. Nor should we be legalistic. That should not be the case. But we should be striving for holiness. We should be striving for holiness with the recognition that we're never going to attain it this side of heaven. Right? You're never going to attain holiness. You will constantly need reminding of the fact that your Savior died for your sins. And so there's this balance, right? There's a balance between striving for holiness on the one hand and recognizing that you can't do it, Jesus Christ did it, right? And so I think that balance is really, really important for us to remember. All right. So let's get going here. Um, 
I want to go back and just mention this again. I say it every week and it gets old. I'm aware of that. But, but I think it's important that we're reminded of it. That there are these two realms that Paul has been talking about. The old realm of Adam and the new realm of Christ. Okay, The old realm of Adam that is characterized by Adam's disobedience, his sin, which leads to death eternally, right? Contrasted with the new realm of Christ and that man's obedience. And that obedience lives to or that obedience leads to eternal life for those who believe. And so it's important that we understand those two realms. Um, when you understand that, that's really the key, I think, to unlocking Romans. When you don't understand that is when you can start to get in trouble. And you'll see that some in this passage. So those two realms are important. So we'll start back here on B, even though we're on old self, um, just to take a look at the verses again, verses 6 and 7. So Roman numeral 6, B, here we go. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. And so we talked about obviously the crucified does not refer to your death because you're not dead yet. Those of you who've seen Monty Python, I apologize for bringing that thought to your mind. That's what came to my mind. No, dead yet. How many of you have seen that movie? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I feel better. It's great. It's not a great movie. It's really funny. But anyway, I'm not dead yet. Uh, instead, this refers to the action, number four there, of God when He chooses to consider us to have died the same death Christ died when we believe. Again, it is positional and forensic. Forensic means courtroom. Okay, it is a judge's verdict. He places you in a new position. You've gone from the old realm to the new realm because God has placed you there upon your belief. Okay, that's very, very important for us to understand. This is forensic and positional language. It is not temporal. In other words, you didn't die by crucifixion. You have a death in the future. Right? At some point in the future, you have a death uh, you know, barring the return of Christ. Right? That death is coming. Um, some of us sooner than others. Uh, and it can come quick. Uh, I've got a former student right now who is clawing for her life. She's, I think, 24, 25 years old. I think she got a common cold and it's killing her. They have no understanding why it is. Like, that comes, right? Death comes. That's the one. Death and taxes, That's those are the two guarantees in life, right? Death and taxes. Uh, but death is coming. That is a temporal thing. It happens in a time and a place. What Paul is talking about here is not temporal. It is positional and forensic in its understanding. So we have been placed in this new realm, free from the characteristics of the old realm. Okay? And so, Paul talks about the old self. Again, it is important to note that we have not been crucified with Christ. We have not been crucified with Christ, but the old self. The old self has been. And I'll give you a couple of passages here. Ephesians 4, verse 22. Did I include that in your notes? Yes. Okay. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see the two realms? The old self and the new self. It's not that, like, you've changed. You are you. Okay? What's happened is you have been repositioned into the new realm. Forensically, you have been declared not guilty. Colossians 3, verse 9, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 
Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. And so there's a lot of misunderstandings about the old and the new, self and man. By the way, the, the ESV, which I use, translates itself, but the word is actually man. It's anthropos. Okay, And so, old man, you may have, if you use King James or New American Standard, I think. Um, maybe if you're using the NIV, it might say that as well. But self, man, same thing, essentially. Many argue here that Paul distinguishes between these natures, be an old nature and a new. That the old has been replaced by the new. Your old nature wiped clean, and your new is changed at conversion that it is added to the old. This is problematic. Okay? It is problematic. It is based on a wrong assumption. Old and new do not refer to parts or natures of a person. Okay? You don't have old of you like your right leg is old and your left leg is new. I would be okay with that. My left knee is not good. But that's not what we're talking about. What Paul is talking about is realm. Transfer from the old to the new. Okay? Which one do you belong to? Do you belong to the old realm? Or do you belong to the new realm? And again, you see this language throughout the entire Pauline corpus. So for those of you who don't get that phrase, when we say that, what we're referring to is everything that Paul has written that we have. We don't have everything that Paul wrote. We know, for example, that he wrote at least three letters to the Corinthians. We have two that have made it into the canon, right? So there's a lot that Paul wrote that we don't have. What we do have in the entirety of its corpus, you see this, this language of two realms, okay? <coughs> They are, again, relational, positional, rather than ontological. Okay, They're not ontological. They refer primarily to a change in relationship, not a change in nature. I think I have that in your notes. You might asterisk that. Underline it, whatever you need. Okay, so this is four, and in my notes, it's B. They refer primarily to a change in relationship. Not a change in nature. By the way, there's some simplicity in that. If your nature is changed, why would you continue to sin? Amen? Amen. So if we're just going to say that it's simply your nature, an ontological understanding of your state of being, right? That's ontology, your state of being. If that were replaced, then why are you sinning? By the way, that's you'll remember we talked about this when we were going through verse 1 and 2 of this chapter, right? The libertine position. Those that say that once you're saved, you can no longer sin. Right? We remember we called it antinomianism, right? Nom is the is the Greek uh, uh, word for law. Antinomianism, the law doesn't apply. And so you have people Throughout history, Luther debated some. We had it here in America with Anne Hutchison. You had these people that were antinomian who said that you can't sin as a believer. Because here's the ditch, right? We talk about falling into ditches on either side of the road. Here's the ditch. If you're going to say that the nature is new, the old nature is gone, and now you have a new nature, if you're going to say that, then what you would have to say, since that new nature is Christ in you, you can no longer sin. There's some danger in that. Okay? Moo. Moo says this, Our old man is not our Adamic or sin nature that is judged and dethroned on the cross and to which is added in, in the believer another nature, the, quote, new man. Rather... The old man is what we were in Adam, the man of the old age who lives under the tyranny of sin and death. As Stott put it, 
What was crucified with Christ was not a part of me called my old nature, but the whole of me as I was before I was converted. Right? We've been trans transferred. We're no longer in that realm because we have been crucified with Christ. We've been transferred positionally, forensically to a new realm. And so again, we see these same contrasting, as I mentioned a moment ago, these same contrasting realms that we see throughout the Pauline corpus. 1 Corinthians 15.45, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Those in Adam exist in part of that old sphere, what Paul calls here the old man. Those in Christ exist in this new sphere, this new realm, what Paul calls the new man. And it's important then that we understand this to work out these con or what could be contradictions in Paul. This verse in Colossians 3, verses 9 to 11 that we wrote, read a few moments ago, make it clear that the believer is no longer the old man and is now the new man. And again, if we're going to say that, it's really important that we understand that cannot be fundamentally nature. Because if it was fundamentally nature, why would you sin? I don't know about you, but I sinned. Uh, I, I mean, listen, I watched football yesterday. I hate Michigan. <laughs> I, I detest Michigan. And they played Ohio State. I'm not really an Ohio State fan, but I hate Michigan, and I know that's their big rival. So I was all in, and Michigan won. I hate Michigan. I guarantee there was moments of sin as I watched that game, and Michigan won. Like, if you're like me, and I assume, I presume that you are, you still struggle with sin in your life. If not, see 1 John chapter 1, verses 8-10. through 10. Because if you say you don't have sin, if you say you don't have anything to confess before the Lord, then that is a sign that He is not in you. So again, we've got to be very, care very careful how we interpret this. And so we have this apparent contradiction, right? We have Colossians 3, 9, 11. Yet in chapter 4, Paul tells the believer to put off the old man and put on the new. So in Colossians, the what... The believer is no longer old and is now new. But then in Ephesians, Paul says, put off the old and put on the new. So there appears to be this contradiction. But the believer has been transferred from the old to the new. The believer has been transferred from the old to the new. But the power of sin in the old must now be resisted in the new, which explains why Paul gives the command in Ephesians 4 to put on the new. So, break this down. Make this a little more clear. If we believe there's a change in nature, in Colossians 3, would seem to indicate that. But then Ephesians 4 says, wait a minute, you need to put off the old and put on the new. Well, is there a change in nature or is there not? Right? Do you see the contradiction there? But it's not a contradiction if we see it as the realms. You have been transferred to the new realm, so act like it. Right? Do you get that? That's what Colossians and Ephesians, that's how those two work out. And we see it here in Romans. You have been transferred from the old realm, the realm of Adam, to the new realm, the realm of Christ. So act like it. That's what Paul said. Act like it. Moose says this, what we were in Adam is no more, but until heaven, the temptation to live in Adam always remains. Well, that's true, isn't it? Just go watch the Michigan football game. So, I feel. Uh, anyway. Okay, so 6b, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So we have another interesting little dilemma here. The Greek word soma here that Paul uses for body often refers to a physical body. Okay? Often refers to a physical body. Some think that Paul is dealing with this Greek uh, 
kind of proto-gnostic position, right? That, that sin is a part of the physical body. And so once the physical body is dead, you're released from sin. Some feel, especially when you look at verse 7, that that's what Paul's talking about here. But the Bible says that that is clearly not true. The Bible says that's clearly not true. The physical self is not inherently, uh, in and of itself, sin. If it were, if what they're saying, the body of sin would then have to mean that the body is particularly susceptible and easily dominated by sin. But that's probably not how Paul is referring to it. He uses the word soma often to deal with the whole person. Okay? In other words, all that you are. Uh, how you relate to the world. How you relate to those around you. Not simply the physical body. Okay, so again, Greeks, this physical self, this skin right here, this is sinful. This is where sin remains. And so the Greeks would say that when the physical self is gone, you're released from sin. Okay? That's not what Paul's saying at all. Paul is saying all that you are, and how you relate to the world, how you relate to other people, that is the body of sin that he's talking about. And so if we are to be freed from sin, we're not talking about physical death here. All that is sinful about me, all of my sin-producing faculties, not just my physical body, uh, must be rendered impotent, brought to nothing, if I am to be free of sin. The word soma brings to the forefront the idea that part of us, that, that that part of us that acts in the real world and is directed by a person's higher nature is a result of newness of life in the realm of Christ or sin, nature in the realm of Adam. So again, it's this concept of realms, this concept of realm realms. So those of us, as we act in the real world, are you going to act in the realm of Christ or are you going to act in the realm of Adam? We are no longer enslaved to sin. We're no longer enslaved to sin. Why? Because we're no longer in the realm of Adam. You still live in the world. You still live in the flesh. You are still tempted by sin. In fact, to be honest, when I'm counseling somebody and um, we're talking about, you know, they don't know if they're a believer or not. Well, what's the difference when you're a believer and not a believer when you're tempted to sin? Like functionally, what's the difference? You may not, you may choose not to, right? Because you can choose not to. But what else? As you approach that sin, yeah. We have the Holy Spirit in us, so we can lean on the Holy Spirit to help us be the power and the strength to do His will. Good, so amen. Love it. And when we have the Holy Spirit in us, what does the Holy Spirit do? It convicts us of that sin, right? So what I would, what I argued to people is they're struggling through. Um, whether or not they're believers, one of the questions that I have for them is, how do you feel about your sin? Are you convicted of sin? If you're not, that's probably a sign that you're not saved. If you are convicted of your sin, does that mean you listen to that conviction all the time? It would be nice if we did, but we don't. But that, the fact that you're convicted, the fact that you're struggling with your sin is a sign of your salvation. Amen? Amen? If you've sinned and you know it and it bugs you, that's probably a good sign. Now, those are all things, of course, being you know, assumed correctly, right? Like, for example, that you have placed your faith in Jesus, right? That you believe that you've received Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Right? If that's the case and you feel convicted of your sin, there's a good chance that you're a believer. 
If you don't feel conviction for sin, again, see 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. Now, you know what? I've mentioned that a lot. Let me just read that real quick to you. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles if you have your Bible. 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to read something before I get there um, to you. This is 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Okay? John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know what? That you have eternal life. John writes very clearly in 1 John chapter 5 that the purpose of his letter, the purpose of 1 John is so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so let's go back then to chapter 1. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to begin in verse 5. And this is the message we have heard from Him and declared to you. That God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. Sounds pretty similar to what Paul's been saying, doesn't it? But, if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say, verse 8, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Pause. If you say you have no sin, then you're lying to yourself. You are not redeemed. That's important. And again, some people have said, well, and I've actually had people say this to me with our call to confession. They say, well, no, no, this is just to unbelievers. But that's not what John says, is it? That this is not written to unbelievers. This is written, I mean, if it's written to unbelievers, it's written in the sense that, uh, hey, <laughs> if this is how you feel, you might want to get right. Right? But this is written to believers. If we confess our sin, verse 9, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all ungodliness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. You see, this is a test. You want to know if you're saved? Do you confess your sin? Not as a, like you have to confess your sin to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. If you say that you are without sin, you cannot be saved. That's a heavy statement. Let me just say that again. According to John, if you say that you are without sin, you are not saved. It's pretty simple. So if you don't have sin to confess then there's a problem. So again, as we talk about this transition from one realm to the next, and listen, this is weighty. Uh, you know, I, I remember a, a few years ago, um, I was talking with Shane Rosty, our old youth pastor, and, and I remember Shane saying this phrase to me. He said, yeah, he goes, when I get up and I preach a sermon, I try to preach to myself, not listen to myself. Like, like, trust me, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here. Like, this is something we need to be serious about. And it's all too unfortunate, in my opinion, how much of the church would rather not deal with this. Right? Instead, and, and I've told you about some of these before, we, we'd rather do, you know, the Avengers for Easter morning. Right? Do the little sketch. Or the Lion King 
For those of you who have not been with us, um, there are churches that um, I've, they've done whole plays about Lion King and Jesus is Simba, and that's what they do for Easter morning. I mean, it's just absurd. We, we would rather tickle ears sometimes than preach about holiness. And we don't want to hear sermons about holiness. I mean, we could pretend like we do, but let's be honest. We don't like to hear that. Because what do they force us to do? We have to confront our own hearts. I've never been a part of a church that does a, a call to confession like this. Not my idea, by the way. Some people have thought it was mine. It's not. It was Chad's idea. Uh, just be very clear about that. Uh, I love that we do it. Because it forces us to focus on where we need to be and where we're not. <coughs> I think it's super important. And so, Striving After Holiness. Uh, there's a great book by Ridges. Um, Pursuit of the Holy. The knowledge of pursuit of the holy, is that what it is? Or the pursuit of holiness. And then he wrote a second one, the <coughs> practice of holiness. You're not going to get there. But man, what a what a great path that is to be on. To pursue holiness. And to recognize that apart from the grace of God, you have no shot of even coming close to that. Alright. Here we go. I gotta get back where I am. So um, small Roman numeral 8 here under the same point, verse 7. One who has died has been set free from sin. One who has died has been set free from sin. Again, the word set free is the word justified. So that is a little thorny. Nowhere else, nowhere else, does Paul connect our death with justification. Okay? Okay? You're justified when? You know, even let me put it to you this way: even Arminians and Calvinists would tell you both that you are justified, either just prior to belief or just just at belief. This is the big theological question of ordo salutis, right? What is the order of your salvation? But both believe that that occurs bang immediately. Okay. This idea that you would become a Christian but not be justified is not biblical at all. So clearly that's not what Paul said. Some, though, because of this, <coughs> say that one who dies, that the one who dies is Christ, but this is a shift that the context does not appear to warrant. So what some people say is, well, clearly that Paul never teaches this, so Paul must be talking about Christ dying here. Because we've got to make justification work here. But that's not the context of the passage. That's my point there. This is not the context of the passage. Therefore, it likely means released from the power of sin. Um, star number five there in your notes. This then is a general truth. By general truth, I mean uh, it's, it's like when my daughter was younger and she would say, No duh, Dad. Like, this is a no-duh kind of statement here. What Paul is saying, when he says one who has died has been set free from sin, death releases a person from sin. You're not going to keep sinning when you're sitting in the grave. That's Paul's point. In other words, because we are in conformity to the death of Christ through a forensic transferal from the realm of Adam to the realm of Christ, we have been, been set free from the enslaving power of sin. Why? Because Christ overcame that. Christ overcame it. Because Christ overcame it, you who believe have been transferred to the realm of Christ. And in being transferred to the realm of Christ, death, death was, or sin was overcome through the penalty that Christ paid at death. Okay. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Just pause for a second. Do you believe that? Yes. Question, do you live like you believe that? See, that's, 
that here's the struggle, right? Here's the struggle. And this is what Paul is getting at in this entire passage. We say amen to it, but do we actually live like it? Are we living in a way that we are going to live with Christ since we have died with Christ? Because I think there's a lot in that word live. Before we even get to expositing the verses, there's a lot in living in Christ that maybe we have forgotten. Because living in Christ is not simply desiring and pursuing holiness. It is also living in grace. If you don't write that down, you should. Let me say that again. It is not simply the pursuit of holiness. We should do that. Well, what we've been talking about. It is not simply the pursuit of holiness, but it is also living in grace. It's important that we know that. I was um, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was like a comic strip, a Christian comic strip or something. They were talking about, you know, playing through all the... Oh no, it was a commercial. That's what it was that I saw. An old commercial. And they were playing through all the bad things that a person had done. And, and the guy, you know, who's allowing you into the, the pearly gates had the scroll. And he's like, well, we're going to skip that one. Oh gosh, we don't even need to go to that. See, some of us are in a position... Where when we look back on our life, we think our lives have been pretty bad. And you know what? You're right. They have been. They've been pretty bad. <coughs> the difference is, you're more in touch with the truthfulness of that statement because everybody in this room, your life has been pretty bad. And if you don't think that, you don't fully understand what Christ has done for you. See, I, I got to preach Colossians 4 a couple of weeks ago. And, and I talked about praying with thankfulness. Why does Thanksgiving matter for us? Because we have an understanding of who we were apart from Christ and who we are in Christ. We're forgiven. It's the evil one that wants you to dwell on what you were. It is our Savior who wants you to dwell on who you are in Him. What does He say in Colossians 3? Set your mind on things above. See, we're not called to relive the past. And I know that some of you have lived lives that you've thought, man, my life was pretty bad. You're right. And some of you feel like, nah, you know, I don't know, my life wasn't too bad. You're wrong. Your life was heinous. Because you lived apart from God. You lived in sin apart from Christ until you were saved. And if you don't believe that, there's a problem. Well, we all have lived horrible lives. We're, some of us just try to... You know, we try to be the scorekeeper. Right? We try to be the ones to determine who's lived the very worst possible life. It's all bad. And it's all bad enough to send us straight to hell apart from what? Apart from Christ. So, I think it's important that when we're talking about striving for holiness, that there is always, always an equal balance, if not an even greater balance, on the belief in grace. Yes, you don't deserve any of it. If you think you do, you probably ought to go to your knees in prayer. You don't deserve any of it. None of us do. But praise God that He has decided to send His Son. Praise God that He has decided to shower grace upon us. So now live in that grace. I think that's an important, important point. Before we even get into the exposition here, 
It is important that we understand that we are to live in grace. Set your mind on things of God. Don't set your mind on those things in the past. There's no reason to do that. No reason to live in that. Again, verse 8. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Again, verses 8 to 10. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. And again, Paul returns to this connection between dying with Christ and being raised with Him. What's fascinating is that there's a future tense here in the verb. We believe we will also live promotes that same discussion that we had back in verse 5. Okay, This refers to the future resurrection of the believer, the future resurrection of the believer, but with present implications. You will be resurrected with Christ. That is the great hope that we have. The great hope that we have, you will be resurrected with Christ. But that also has implications for how we live today. Do we live like we believe that? This refers to the future resurrection of the believer, but with present implications as we've been transferred out of the realm of Adam and death into the realm of Christ and life where the power of sin has been broken. Verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. We know that we will live with Christ because Christ overcame death when He rose from the grave. Um, you know, I, I, this is not in the notes here. It's fascinating to me. What did the Jews believe about the resurrection? <clears throat> they're kind of all over the place. Generally, they didn't think very highly of it. It was kind of a shadowy place for those that did believe in a resurrection. What do you believe about the resurrection? What is your resurrection going to be like? Uh, you know, I think about, like, you know, I can't tell you, I've worked with youth for a long time, and, and I would hear youth and young people say things like, oh, I hope Jesus comes back after I get married. <laughs> right? Like, we've probably all been there to a certain degree in, in things. Not me. I hope he comes back now. Amen. Like, yeah. Like, before... You don't have to listen to me drone on anymore. Like, let's go. Right? Like, I, I'm not kidding. I, I think it's important for us to understand that there has to be this present effect of the resurrection upon us. <coughs> there has to be that. You know, I, I do... Uh, I've done two, well, I've done one, one funeral now as a pastor, and I've spoken a memorial. One was a believer and one wasn't. Uh, let me tell you, there's a difference. When I speak at a believer's funeral, it's a celebration. Yeah, we're sad. Of course we're sad. There's somebody who's been meaningful in our lives and they've moved on that sad. There's no doubt that there's some sadness there. And in fact... Jesus grieved Lazarus. He, he grieved Lazarus' death, didn't he? Jesus did what? He wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Right? The, the, there's grief there. There's no doubt there's grief there. Paul doesn't say not to grieve. What does he say? <clears throat> Don't grieve like the pagans do. Right? So, yeah, there's grief. But it's a celebration. Why is it a celebration for a believer? Because we believe in the resurrection. I love that. I love the fact that that's, we understand that. Now, do we live like that today? Do we live today like we believe in the resurrection? 
that we will be resurrected, what would you do different? Pause and think about that for a second, if you would. Sometimes we get up here and we tell you what you should be doing. Well, you should be doing this. How would you live your life different if today you believed, I mean, really believed in the resurrection? Oh, maybe it would be not different at all for you. Or maybe you'd find some things that maybe aren't quite as important as you thought they were. It's, it's I think, an important thing for us to consider. I know it is for me. I probably would not detest Michigan football as much as I do. But, but, and I joke about that, but I'm not joking about that. I hate Michigan. Like, I watch that game in the hopes that Michigan would lose, and miserably. I really hate Michigan. But, yeah. Same reason I watch the Alabama game. Don't they win? <laughs> no, they lost in the last second. Touched on a far corner of the end zone and beat off her. Second. Full time. Oh okay, yeah, Clint. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Verse 5 and 8. It says now, for it and now it. And I had a Greek scholar. They told me we should cross out the if and put since. A lot of times it seems like we treat those statements as questions. If mm -hmm. this is right. true. Instead, Paul is saying these are statements of fact. Right. They're if then statements. Yeah. 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 But I think too often we kind of take the if part and we question. Yes, we do. We do. That's a very, very good point. And I think we do it with hope, too, don't we? Like, we think of hope the way I hope to win the lottery. Which is really difficult since I don't play. I do hope to win the lottery. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I hope that it is. You know that's the definition of insanity, right? Yeah, right. So, but the hope that we have is something that we can take to the bank, right? It is assured. So, yeah, I think even just how we interpret those things is important. Okay. We will press on here. So we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We know that we will live with Christ because Christ overcame death. And we know that death has lost its sting. Death has lost its sting. And I don't know that I fully have, have come to terms with what that means. Because I don't know that I've fully come to terms with mortality. By the way, some of you remember Lacan, uh, Ajayi that went here, moved a couple years ago. Um, Lacan and I, when I was teaching, and he was a, an administrator here at the hospital, said the biggest concern that he thinks, or, or the biggest problem that we have with health care in America today. <clears throat> you want to talk cost of health care. The biggest <clears throat> cost of health care that we have, the biggest problem that leads to this cost, is the fact that we're not in touch with our own mortality. We will try to preserve our lives to the nth degree. Isn't that true? He said where it used to be that grandma was dying and so we would all come together and we would go visit grandma and then she would die in the family home. We don't do that anymore. We will spend, um, according to some statistics, something like 90% of the total amount that we will pay ever in our entire lives for health care in the last six months of our life. What does that say? about how we view the resurrection. What does that say about us and, and whether or not we view death as having lost its sting? Isn't that an interesting point? <clears throat> Has death lost its sting for us? Unlike Lazarus, who had to die again, think about that. Lazarus had to die twice. <laughs> That's a bummer. Right? <laughs> Lazarus had to die twice. But unlike him who had to die again, Christ conquered death 
And this prefigures the resurrection of all believers. So death is more of a passing, right? It's a movement. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. We will be resurrected. Notice the focus of verse 9 here is on Jesus Christ. Christ will never die again. Death is no longer Lord over Christ. Remember, Christ, I don't know if I actually wrote, I, this is my note, sorry. But remember, Christ was born in the old realm. Right? He was born in the realm of Adam. He was born in the realm of Adam's disobedience and sin, which leads to death. He overcame that realm. How did Christ overcome that realm? He lived a blameless life, a holy life, and he accepted the penalty, received the penalty for our sins. He overcame that realm. Again, two ages, two realms of salvific history. Because of Christ's realm, the lordship, uh, because of Christ's resurrection, the lordship of death over him is broken. That word literally means the Lord of. Okay, here. I think that's important. Death no longer is Lord over Christ. Christ defeated death. And we will share in that defeat of, of death through our transfer to His realm as we live with Him. Amen. Amen.